All right, so the next step is to be able to represent our molecular formulas using Lewis dot structures and to be able to predict what our molecular formulas are going to look like when we have covalent bonds forming. So molecular formulas can be drawn in multiple different ways. You can represent them as a molecular formula. So this is a formula that's going to show the number and kinds of atoms in one molecule of a compound. So you guys have already been doing that. So you, you're able to recognize when you have formulas that these subscripts represent the number of atoms of that particular element within that compound. So for example, our H2O molecule, this subscript of two says that there are two hydrogen atoms in one molecule of water. And if there is no subscript indicated, that's gonna indicate that the subscript is actually one so that there would be one atom of oxygen in a molecule of water. So we can also represent this as a structural formula where we're writing the shared electrons as a single line between the two atoms that are sharing electrons. So in the structural formula, we've got our two hydrogens and each of these hydrogens is sharing an electron with the oxygen atom. So remember, our oxygen has six valence electrons. It wants to share two of those to get to the octet state. And hydrogen has one electron, and it wants to share that electron so that it can become full at the 1s2 and have a total of two electrons in its outer shell. So it achieves this by sharing those electrons with the oxygen atom. So we represent that shared pair of electrons by this single line in this diagram. The Lewis dot structure is a modification of this structural representation here in that you also show the lone pair electrons that are left on the atoms. So on the oxygen, we know that there are six valence shell electrons around this atom. Two of those electrons are being involved in these shared pairs and that leaves the four electrons that are remaining as lone pair electrons. So an example then of a Lewis dot structure would represent our shared pairs still as lines and then it also is going to indicate when you have lone pairs of electrons that are by themselves on the atoms. So this is an example of a Lewis dot structure. So when you have these electrons that are by themselves and they're not being shared with another atom, they're called lone pairs of electrons. and these lone pairs of electrons are important because they take up space. They are actually orbiting around the oxygen atom, and so their orbital shape is going to take up space around this atom. And so you can think of you can think of this as like a big basketball kind of sitting on top of the oxygen atom where those lone pair electrons are, or the lone pair electrons on the nitrogen. It actually is going to help determine the shape of the overall molecule because there's pressure of the electronegativity that the electrons have when they're spinning in their orbit around the nitrogen atom. And you can see there's no lone pair electrons when you have four shared pairs. There's no extra space to have those lone pairs of electrons. So Lewis structures are important because you can indicate where you have lone pairs of electrons, such as the two lone pairs that are found on our water molecule, and you can also designate where the shared pairs of electrons are as well between the oxygens and the hydrogens in our water molecule. So when we're drawing our Lewis structures, it becomes important to be able to use our periodic table to help us predict how many covalent bonds that each atom is going to want to form. So if we're walking down our periodic table, we know that our hydrogen is only going to form one covalent bond. Then it's going to be full because the 1s2 orbital is the only one that it has, and so you can only have two electrons floating around our hydrogen. So we know hydrogen is always going to form one covalent bond. If we walk out on the periodic table, and we'll take a look at this in a little more detail, we'll see that carbon has four valence shell electrons in its outer shell. And because it has this, it wants to form four covalent bonds to get to the octet state. Nitrogen, right next to carbon, has one additional electron in its outer shell. So it's got five electrons as its valence shell. 
So we'd have one, two, three, four, and then these would start pairing up. So we've got three spaces that this guy can form bonds with, and so this one wants to form three covalent bonds. If we walk out one additional place, oxygen is going to have six valent shell electrons, and two of those are going to be paired as the lone pair electrons. Two are unpaired and want to form bonds. So we've got two possible covalent bonds that our oxygen can have. The halogen row, so this is, starts with fluorine, remember, can form one covalent bond. They have seven electrons in their outer shell. They've got three lone pairs of electrons. And they have one position that is available for sharing to reach their octet state. So this is an example then of our Lewis structures as we go out the periodic table. So we know our carbons have four bonds, nitrogen has three, oxygen can have two bonds, our halogens can have one bond, and you can see that the order as you go across the periodic table rows, you increase your lone pair of electrons. Carbon has none, nitrogen has one lone pair, oxygen has two lone pair, the halogen column has three lone pair, and our hydrogen bonds, remember, can only form one shared pair because it can only house two electrons total. So in some ways, then, our Lewis structures can be assembled a bit like a puzzle. So each piece, an atom, is going to fit together by connecting the bonding sites. So first, you have to find the number of electrons needed to satisfy each atom separately two electrons for hydrogen and then eight electrons for all other atoms except for our expanded shell ones that are our special cases like sulfur and phosphorus. Then you're going to add up the number of valence electrons that you actually have and if the octet rule is obeyed then the number of electrons that you need minus the number of electrons that you have is going to equal the number of electrons that you have to share. And we'll walk through some examples then using this kind of rule for drawing our Lewis structures so that you, you can accurately actually draw these structures. We also kind of have a step-by-step -step process for doing this as well that we'll walk through before we get to the uh, writing demonstration as well. So if we have a compound like ethane, so this has two carbons and six hydrogens that are available for bonding sites. And acetaldehyde is another compound as well. It's got the two carbons down here. It's got four hydrogens and it's got one oxygen. So if we look and, and we kind of process the number of electrons that are around here, our four hydrogens need a total of eight electrons, right? Because each hydrogen wants two total. Our two carbons and our one oxygen are going to need 24 electrons, right, because they each want a total of eight. So there's three atoms here, three times eight is 24 electrons. We need a total then of 32 electrons. So we add our eight to our 24 here, so we need 32 electrons total. Our hydrogens have four electrons. Each one comes with one. Our two carbons have eight electrons. Each one comes with four in its valent shell. And our one oxygen has six electrons in its valence shell. So we have 18 electrons. So we need 32. Subtract off the 18 electrons. That's going to equal 14 electrons. So we need 14 shared pairs. So if we have 14 shared pairs, if we divide that by 2, we'll get the number of bonds that we need to create within our molecule, right? Because each shared pair is 2 electrons. So there should be seven bonds to share 14 electrons. Then there's going to be four electrons left over that have to form the unshared lone pairs of electrons that are left over, right? Because we've got 18 electrons. We need to share 14 electrons in shared pairs. That leaves four left over. So those four divided by two have to fit into two orbitals. Because remember, each orbital is going to take two electrons, just like each shared pair is also going to take two electrons. So when we're building our molecule then, if you look at acetaldehyde, we've got each carbon needs four bonds, and so they typically are going to make up our central atom. But you can see there's one, two, three, four shared pairs here, 
and then there's five, six, seven shared pairs. So those are our seven bonds that are sharing those 14 electrons around here. We also have the four that are left over because we had 18 to start with and so those are forming those lone pair electrons inside the oxygen atom that we know has those lone pair based on its Lewis structure. So remember our Lewis structure here shows that oxygen has two lone pairs and can share two bonds. So this structure is obeying the octet rule in how many bonds are wanting to form. Each hydrogen only is forming a single bond, shared pair. Our oxygen is forming two bonds and each of our carbons are forming four bonds. So with our acid aldehyde structure we've put this structure together correctly so that all of the atoms are happy and are reaching their filled electron configurations whether that's the two electrons for the hydrogen or the eight valence shell electrons for the carbon and the oxygen atoms. So for drawing our Lewis structures then you start by determining the number of electron pairs that are present add up all the valence shell electrons and divide by two the next thing you have to do is is to try to determine the central atom and so the central atom is often the one that is the least electronegative atom this is going to provide the scaffold and so oftentimes this is going to be carbon so if you see a molecule where you have carbon you should you should think that the carbon is likely going to be a central atom other ones that can be central atoms too in molecules would be sulfur and phosphorus especially when they take on their expanded orbital constructs these guys can also act as central atoms then you're going to set up a skeletal structure with single bonds first you'll fill up the ligand atoms to complete the octet rule so the atoms the ligand atoms are the things that are going to be extending off of the central atom so these are the atoms that are on the outside of the molecule you got to make them complete their octets first and then you'll try to satisfy the center atom so you bring any extra pairs then back to the central atom and then you do what's called calculating our formal charge so the central atom should be equal to or less than the overall charge of the molecule or it should be negative in its charge so you adjust the formal charges then according to our generation of double and triple bonds and so we'll see some examples so that you can actually see what the formal charges are and how they're calculated so a formal charge is like an accounting system or an accounting procedure it allows the chemist to determine the location and the charge in the molecule as well as to compare how good your Lewis structure is going to be so you want to you want to draw the most stable structure and we'll see as our molecules keep getting bigger and bigger the Lewis structures that you can draw for them are going to vary you'll, you'll be able to put them together in different ways and so you want to find the best way to put them together that's going to be the most stable and the most likely to form within the environment so this is the equation that you can use to calculate your formal charge formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons and then minus and this is in parentheses the number of non bonding electrons plus half of the number of bonding electrons so let's calculate our formula charges with an example now because this will make more sense that way so if we're considering the molecule H2CO2 there's actually two possible Lewis structures that you could draw for this molecule and each has the same number of bonds that you would predict and you'll see that one looks better than the other and so we can determine which is better by determining which has the least formal charge on it so it takes energy essentially to get a separation of charge in a molecule and so this could be indicated then when you calculate your formal charges so the structure that has the least formal charge on it is going to be the lower one in energy and it's going to be the better Lewis structure and the one that's more likely to happen within nature so here are, are, are the possible combinations for making our H2CO2 molecule so we again know that in this molecule our carbon has less electronegativity than our oxygen and we know hydrogen can only form one bond 
So our carbon is likely to be the central atom that the other atoms are sticking off of. So we're going to put this in the middle, and then we're going to create a couple of different structures. We know that the carbon wants to form four bonds, oxygen wants to form two bonds, and each hydrogen wants to form one bond. So we can draw our Lewis structures. So the first thing that we want to do is calculate how many electrons that we have, and then we want to subtract off the number that we need to complete the octet, right? So we know hydrogen needs two for each of these. So there's going to be four electrons here that we need. Carbon is going to want to have eight electrons, and our two oxygens also want to have eight electrons. So we've got four electrons for the hydrogens, right? Two for each of them, and then 24 for the carbon and the oxygen. So we need a total of 28 electrons around this molecule. And then we look at how many we have. Hydrogen's going to bring in two, right? The carbon's going to bring in four, so that's six so far. And each oxygen is going to bring in six electrons. So that's 12, that's going to be 18 electrons that are, that are brought in by this molecule. We said we needed 28. So that means that we're going to need to share 10 of those electrons. And we're going to share them then in five bonds. So we're going to need to make five bonds in our molecule. So you can see that there's a total of one, two, three, four, five bonds in each of these diagrams where we have the molecule structured. So we're using carbon as a central atom. And we first bond the most electronegative atoms to that. So we've got oxygen bonded to the carbon molecule. And we know that oxygen wants to form two bonds, wants to form two bonds based on its electronegativity. So we're going to take care of that first. And so if we bonded both to the carbon in double bonds, we would fill up that carbon molecule. We wouldn't have anywhere to add the hydrogens to it, right? Because we just have carbon dioxide. And so that's not going to work to have the structure where you've got two double bonds between these molecules. So we have to fit our hydrogens in here. So one of these hydrogens is going to fit onto the oxygen molecule, onto the carbon molecule, and one is going to fit onto one of the oxygen molecules. So you can see just by drawing the upper structure here that there's too many bonds around this oxygen. Right is forming three shared pairs. This oxygen is only forming one shared pair, and it's got three lone pairs. It's not going to be very happy like this. And so a more common structure would be like the one written down here, where the, each oxygen has two shared pairs of electrons, and that's what it wants to do. The carbon has four shared pairs, and each hydrogen also has a single shared pair. So when we're putting our puzzle pieces together, this is going to be the confirmation that is going to be more likely. And so we can actually prove this mathematically by calculating formal charges. So if we calculate our formal charge, you can calculate a formal charge for each atom. So remember, we said our equation for calculating formal charges is the number of valence electrons minus non-bonding electrons plus half of the bonding electrons. So if we calculate our formal charge for hydrogen in this molecule, it doesn't matter, each hydrogen is the same. It's forming one shared pair. So we've got one electron in the shared pair. So our formal charge is calculated by calculating number of valence electrons. So we know hydrogen has one valence electron minus the non-bonding electrons. There's zero for that, plus half of the bonded electrons. There's two in the shared pair. We have half of that. That's going to be one, right? Two divided by two is going to be one. And so one electron minus one electron is going to be a zero formal charge. That's when that atom is going to be the happiest, when it's at the lowest charge state. For the carbon, we know the carbon starts with four valence electrons. So there's four electrons minus the non-bonded electrons. There's none. There's no lone pair electrons, plus half of the bonded electrons. There's eight 
bonded pair forming the octet around the carbon. So one half times eight is going to be four. So the formal charge on our carbon is also going to be zero in this case. Now we'll look at the top oxygen, which we'll call oxygen A. And our formal charge on this guy, we've got six electrons in the valence shell. In this diagram, we've got six electrons as lone pair electrons, non-bonded. So we've got six electrons here, plus half of the bonded pair of two. So six plus one is seven electrons, minus the six electrons in the valence shell. This has a net negative one formal charge on this oxygen. Now let's calculate the formal charge on this oxygen. We've got six electrons in the valence shell, minus the two electrons in the lone pair that are up here, non-bonded, plus half of the bonded electrons, one, two, three, there's six electrons in these bonds. And so you divide by two, we've got a total of three electrons here. So two plus three is going to be five electrons minus, and we'll subtract this from the six electrons in the valence shell. So this oxygen has a formal charge of plus one. So there's formal charges on this molecule, minus one here and a plus one here. All of the others are zero, which is the best state to be in. So in this molecule, if we calculate formal charges for our oxygens, A and B, we'll see that they come out to be formal charges of zero because we've got the six valence shell electrons again. We've got four as non-bonding electrons in this case. And then two are in shared pairs. So we've got a total of four electrons in shared pairs. Divide that by the two, and we're going to see that we get six electrons minus six and that's going to be a formal charge of zero on this molecule. The same thing for oxygen B when it's written in this way, sharing the two bonds with the carbon and the hydrogen atom. So this representation of this molecule down here is the most stable form of the molecule and the form that this molecule will take most of the time. Under certain circumstances, the atoms can be coerced into shifting their sharing electrons into this type of, of formation. And you can form this double bond at this position here. And so this happens less frequently because it puts formal charges on the oxygens. And so this is less stable, but it can be coerced into taking this conformation. It's not a forbidden conformation. So one of the things that you should start thinking about when we're putting these types of molecules together is that they have the ability to form other structural, other structural representations of the covalent sharing and the covalent bonds. Even if they don't take that conformation for very long, they can be very active and it can help new bonds form or it can help bonds break. And so these are called resonance structures when you have different representations of the same molecule, just a shifting of their bonded pairs of electrons. And so this is the less stable form up here. It's going to occur much less frequently than this molecule here. So there's higher probability that this molecule is actually in this state more often than there is than it exists in this state. But there is some propensity for it to shift infrequently to this state because the electrons can be carried and balanced in that equation in that manner. So our two possible Lewis structures then are shown again below. They're connected by a double-headed arrow showing that there's transition then or electron flow within this molecule so that it can obtain this state once in a while. So they only differ in the arrangement of the valence electrons in the molecule. No atoms have been moved. The atoms are still in the same conformation, same position within the molecule. So when this has happened, these are called resonance structures. And the better Lewis structure or resonance structure is that which has the least amount of formal charge. So this is the better Lewis structure, and this molecule would exist in this state more often of the time. So again, with our Lewis structures, there are some exceptions to the octet rule that we've already talked about. We've already talked about sulfur and phosphorus. 
Hydrogen is also an exception because it can only have a maximum of two electrons and it's full because it only has the one s orbital. Boron and aluminum only have six electrons that they can actually share and it's because they only have three electrons in their outer shell and so they're only going to form a total of three bonds and in fact aluminum is on the metal side of the metalloid curve as we start stair stepping down there and so aluminum is actually more likely to form ionic bonds whereas boron being a non-metal and having non-metal characteristics is more likely to share those electrons and form covalent bonds but either way there's a maximum of six electrons that can be partnered in these in these shared pairs. It can never reach the octet state because it doesn't have any electrons in that fourth orbital. So boron is a good example here. It's sharing with our fluorines. So we have boron as an example of not achieving the octet state because it doesn't have enough electrons. And then we notice that our p-block orbitals in the third row and above can start having these expansion of the d orbitals that we talked about for sulfur and phosphorus as our examples. And so we said phosphorus can take on five bonds by having electron expansion. And so this is an exception to the octet rule. Because phosphorus normally by the octet rule would want to share three bonded pairs to reach the octet state. So we'll stop here for our Lewis structures. We'll also do some video diagramming to draw our Lewis structures, calculate our formal charges, and calculate how many bonds that we're actually going to need to create our Lewis structures. So we get some more practice doing that.